Hello, thank you, everybody. Um, so this is the first research talk from Chiba Institute of Technology Center for Radical Transformation. Um, I'm Joey Ito, the director of the center. And today we'll hear a presentation from Eduardo Castello. Uh, Eduardo is a visiting researcher at the Center for Radical Transformation uh, or the Henkaku Center in Japanese. But he's and he's also a research affiliate um, for the media media lab at MIT, where I used to be the director. And before that, uh, he was a student in various capacities at MIT, and I think he got his PhD at Osaka University. So I think we'll see some of the um, uh, work from there. And he's going to be presenting Gakachu, a self-employed robot artist, and it has all of the anti-disciplinary uh, aesthetics and somewhat humorous but very deep. Uh, sorts of uh, elements that we really like to see in the research, both at the Media Lab and now at uh, the Center for Radical Transformation. So I very much look forward to his presentation and um, your interaction um, and questions as we get into the discussion section afterwards. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Eduardo. OK, thank you very much, like Joy. It's a pleasure like to be here, really. Uh, so what I'm going to present like today is a, a little bit like the road of like the last uh, like three, uh, four years, you know, that like I try like to mix as you were saying in an interdisciplinary way, two things that apparently don't do much with each other, but together they do something interesting, which is the world of robotics and the world of like blockchain-based technology, right? So I am going to introduce uh, this uh, Gakachu, which basically is like a robot that it is self-sustainable in an economic way. But uh, before that, you know, what we're going to introduce is the road like to this Gakachu, the road like to this like first economically autonomous robot, right? So without further delay, let's start the presentation. And I always like to, to start presentations with a little bit of history, right? So as you were saying, I did my master's and my PhD in Handai, in Osaka University, in Ishiguro Lab. And yeah, basically what you're seeing in the picture is one uh, of the guys that like uh, directed my PhD thesis. Now the other is his robot clone. So um, Ishiguro Sensei, uh, had like this idea of creating like a clone like uh, uh, of, of himself in order like to understand you know what's the human robot interaction right like uh, how humans you know uh, um, deal you know with uh, with robots and how uh, how these interactions like happen right so a video is worth always like more than uh, one thousand words like so so here you have like uh, both of them. Uh, in the same in the same room so this is not normally you know what is, is it was supposed to happen because this uh, robot is, is uh, made in order like, to do a telepresence so the robot is sent like where issue doesn't set us want to be right but here they are in the same room right so you can see is that how the real Ishiguro sensei is being captured you know all the movements like the the mouth like etc and all these are transferred like, to the robot right so the robot replicates what the what the issue sensei is like, doing right so Somehow, right, like uh, the the idea of issue was something like about the future of robotics was this, right? Like, so you have a very complicated like robot, very complex, very expensive, you know, that that is that is super realistic, that can represent you, right? But um, after doing a lot of like research like with him and understanding, you know, that the the, the push forwards of like this technology, I understood that my version of the future of robotics was not exactly like this. It, it was a little bit more like this, right? So. So what you're seeing here is instead of like one very complicated like robot, you are seeing here a, a group of very simple robots. In the in the field, we call it a swarm, right? Like it's basically a system of a, of very of very simple robots, right? That through cooperation and collaboration, they can do very complicated like tasks. But the individuals of this like system are very very simple. You can think about robotic ants or robotic bees, right? So in this uh, video, what we are seeing is a uh, kind of like a football field, right? Where robots like a uh, uh, have like a base, right? Which is like the center of this football field, which represents kind of like a nest, right? And then like uh, robots have to decide if they want to uh, explore or exploit, you know, like the information that they can find like outside like this nest, right? So in, in this case, uh, you see these 3D printed tokens and these 3D printed tokens represent uh, resources, represent data, represent like a task to do, right? These robots have to decide whether they want to spend some energy, some battery, like uh, in order to stay in the nest and like wait for like uh, another situation, like to 
to be activated or they want to invest like some energy in order to explore right uh, the field and get these like uh, these tasks done right so the interesting thing like about this is that in these systems there is no there's no leader there is no there is no boss right there is no centralized point of failure for example the information doesn't go like to to a hub to a router right these these robots organize themselves in a peer to peer like way which is very interesting because uh, this um, this capability, this kind of like complex systems capability, gives like this uh, these robots the, the possibility to be fault tolerant, be robust, be, be resilient, right? Like so, if for example I kill one of the robots or like twenty five percent of the robots, you know, like uh, stop functioning, the others can cope, right? Like uh, with this like problem. Something that, for example, like the, the, the super expensive like centralized like, system that we saw before cannot do that. It's not designed like that. But uh, when I was doing my PhD, like in in this like, topic, I realized that yes, you know, this this field is somehow very, 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 very polarized. You know, like many other things, like we have like in society, right? Like so, in one hand, you know, there was like people like doing fundamental science, you know, like in the field. No, I want to uh, do research on like these and ants, and I want to understand, you know, the equations, you know, that like uh, deal, you know, with the system, and this is just what I want like to do. But for example, at the other side of the spectrum, there was like people uh, talking about, wow, these systems are super good, like in order to deliver uh, packages, you know, like uh, for Amazon, right? Or, you know, do like a swarm of self-driving cars, like in cities, so so people can move like around the city, right? So they, they were very focused on the application of these systems, right? But they didn't understand, you know, what are like the, the problems and like the, the drawbacks of putting these kind of like systems in the city. For example, you know, uh, these systems are very interesting, like for fault tolerance or robustness, because they are distributed, right? But what do you do if something goes wrong? You know, how can you stop like a system that actually doesn't have a centralized point of failure or a centralized point of like uh, of information? So I understood that uh, nobody was in the middle of these like, two communities, right? Nobody was trying to bridge the gap between the fundamental like a uh, uh, scientist and like the application only like focused people. So then I started to explore, you know, what was in the middle, right? And then I realized that these systems do, for example, do not have security standards. So what happens if actually you deploy uh, like a swarm of self-driving cars in the city and, you know, one car or two cars, you know, get hacked and start to spread lies like in the, in the system? Or, for example, you know, how, how we reach consensus in these systems? How do we agree that like a, a road is blocked, right? And so the system should not go there or the system should balance, you know, to other parts of the cities. How, how, how this happens like in a system of robots. But also most interestingly, there is no business models, right? Like for these kind of like robotic systems, right? So there's no incentivization of like entrepreneurs and other people like to build these systems and put them into the market. And this is in the last uh, section, this is where I will talk about Gagachu, right? But before that, let's let's go, let's go there. So as I was saying, the problem with, so of these systems is that uh, redundancy, you know, the, the same thing that brings uh, full tolerance and robustness and all this stuff comes at a cost, right? And the cost is complexity. The more you scale a system, the more complicated it is like to understand what's going on, right? And for example, imagine an operator that needs like to somehow check the what's going on like in this like one. So if you have one robot, you just focus on one robot. If you have two robots, then you have to focus half of your time in one robot, half of your other time in another robot, right? But imagine you have one thousand robots. What do you do, right? So sometimes, right, the the as the system scales and becomes more autonomous, right? The cognitive ability to understand the system is, is surpassed, right? So, uh, so I was thinking, is there any way in which actually we can put like a technology uh, so we can create this plateau, this, this uh, green line in which we can scale the system, make it more autonomous, more complex, but at the same time, don't surpass the cognitive ability to understand what's going on. And, and this is like a, a something that I put together like in 2016 in a, in a project called a, a Blockchain, a new framework for swarm robotic systems. And, and this is how I started like to uh, develop like the, the research like in these like two fields. So um, somehow what I understood very early in this like project is that in order to create this uh, green line, right, you need something called trust. Okay, so you need somehow uh, the understanding that something happened, yeah, without actually uh, checking it like yourself, you know, without actually having to see it with your own eyes, right? And 
I found that the one of the very promising technologies like for doing that, right, was blockchain technology. And I want to give a disclaimer like to, to you all. So I normally say blockchain technology in quote marks, right? And it's because uh, right now in the world of today, uh, the concept of blockchain or the metaverse or these kind of things are completely empty like concepts, right? Could mean everything and nothing at the same time. So just like for you to know, I don't think that blockchain is the solution to every single problem in humanity, right? I don't think that uh, carpenters like to use like a blockchain you know, like in order to handle you know, their budget. But, uh, but I think that uh, blockchain technology not understood as a, as a hammer that would nail everything, but as understood as a Swiss knife, yeah? A collection of tools that are interesting, yeah? Could do a lot of good for fields that have problems and currently we don't know how to address these problems. For example, robotics, right? Let me give you an example. So the first thing that we did like in the, in the media lab like about this combination of like blockchain and, and, and robotics was to say, okay, so for example, we have robots like these nows, right? That are being used for uh, autistic therapies, right? Like, so they are put in hospitals, then you, you make them like interact with kids. Kids love like uh, autistic kids love robots, right? And, uh, and these uh, robots somehow tell stories like to these kids and, and tell them, you know, how to interpret emotions, right? But the problem is that every time the robot like sees a new kid, it's kind of like seeing like a, like a blank page, right? The, the robot cannot adapt or cannot like a tailor, you know, like the, the therapy because it cannot access to any information like about the kid because like for, for legal reasons, this is not, this is not possible. So for example, uh, a kid or any, any patient in the United States, like a, for us is, is basically that data wise is like this, right? So there's data that doctors collect and puts us in a database, educators, you know, like have like information about these kids and put them in their own database and public institutions also have uh, data about like these kids in, in particular, and then they put it in their own database. By law, these databases cannot talk to each other, right? So what we understood is, okay, so if we cannot see the data, right, at least can we ask questions to the data? Yes, I, I don't want to see the data, right? Somehow I want to maximize data utility without breaching data security, right? So, okay, I will breach security if I will see the data, but can I ask questions to this data and get aggregated information? So I can use this information, I can uh, exploit this uh, aggregated information without actually breaching the privacy of the, of the data. And it turns out that, yeah, it's possible. So we designed like a like a robot interface that while it was doing the, the therapies could uh, ask questions like to these databases, right? And then receive like aggregated information. So with the aggregated information, uh, it could tailor like the, the, the therapy, right? What we understood is that not only as a machine learning model, like this is useful, but also is useful in order to audit you know, this robot interface. Like, so the, it, it, this was the first time that if you were able like to, if you made the robot like to register the question and register the answer, then the legal uh, guardians of the kid or anybody or the hospital could go to the robot and say, okay, how much information do you have about this kid? How much information did you receive, you know, like from this person or this other person or where I want to know, I want to audit you. Right, and this was the first time that like we created like a robot interface. This uh, this interface between the digital and the physical world that was auditable. Right, imagine doing this like with, with Alexa, for example. Right. So at the end, like uh, what we understood is that uh, different robots in different hospitals, right, were able like to access the knowledge that other robots in other hospitals achieved. So it was kind of like a, a whole network of of interfaces that were doing these these therapies. But, uh, but the robot that, for example, was in a very uh, low populated area and didn't see many cases, right, of like certain, like a problem within the autistic spectrum, didn't have to wait until somebody came in order to learn like about this, could actually ping the robot that, for example, was in New York City or in Boston that already has seen these cases and already has experience about how, how to deal you know, with, this, with these aspects in order to get this information and use it like in the moment, right? So. So we created like a, also like a federated learning, like a, a, a idea in which all the robots saw all the data, even the data never moved, you know, like from the, the original silos, right? So maybe this was like the first uh, case, you know, that like we, we used this uh, blockchain technology in order to audit a process that the robot was doing, right? But then immediately, we understood that we said, okay, this is fantastic. This is cool. You know, now you can audit like a robot. Uh, even you can move like information in a network and in a secure way. But what happens, for example, if 
the members of this uh, community of robots are not are not good you know what happens if they lie what happens if actually this becomes public robot infrastructure let's imagine like that and and there's some incentives like for the robots like to not work correctly or to be hacked what will happen in the, in such network right and i mean this is not like something that is is a blade runner like problem it's something that actually happened like today for example we can we see many news about self driving cars being super super easy to hack and then uh, being able like to to cause uh, a lot of like problems because the the interesting thing about robots is that a robot is basically a computer that has the physical ability to interact with the world right but when you hack like a computer like a normal like pc or laptop right there could be digital consequences even economic consequences but when you hack a robot there could be also physical consequences right so think about this for example do you uh, do you remember when maybe four or five years ago there was this um uh, uh, ransomware called uh, um well i don't remember the name but uh, but this ransomware at some point in time they showed you like a pop-up like window in your pc saying a, I encrypted all your hard drive. Like, if you don't pay, I don't know, one Bitcoin or one thousand dollars in Bitcoin, like uh, into this address, I will uh, keep your files like uh, encrypted like forever. Blah blah blah. So imagine that, right, in a self-driving car, in which you are in a self-driving car, you know, like in a highway, you're driving at like a well, sixty miles per hour or eighty miles per hour, and then uh, there's a pop-up window coming in the dashboard saying this car has been hacked uh, this car is not going to break until uh, you don't transfer one thousand dollars in bitcoin to this address yeah things th things get different right so many researchers also have seen that for example in these systems uh, that the, the ap application focus guys you know like want to like for example self-driving cars swarmish self-driving cars in, in cities have like a lot of problems because if you know which car for example is going through times square and you hack that car and you and you block it then you can block the traffic of a whole city so it's so it's so it's a system that because of its complexity can also be weaponized right so what we did uh, here i hope that this okay this place is to say okay so let's imagine that we can uh, uh, create like a swarmish system in which uh, robots uh, become backbots in which robots start like to spread lies do we have any kind of like mechanism as a collective in this in this sense to spot lies do we have a lie detector you know like for robots and well so what you, you will see what we achieved like so in this uh, experiment what we did is like a, we put like a swarm of like 24 robots very similar to the ones that you saw like uh, doing this for aging getting like these like 3d printed like tokens and in here, the robots are trying like to reach a consensus about what's the majority color, like in the in the floor, in this like checkerboard. So, we conducted many experiments uh, uh, with easier uh, patterns like, or, or more complicated like patterns. So at the end, the robots had to say, in this in the case of the video, black is the majority color, right? So robots wander around. They have like a sensor, you know, like at the back, and then somehow they can say, oh, I travel one meter and then i saw these many like uh, cells you know black versus white so i think that uh, white is a majority color or black is a majority color right and then they share their opinions so we said okay let's do this so um, let's try like the uh, state of the art algorithms in consensus like for uh, google for facebook like for for all these like big companies right and then let's uh, compare it like to a blockchain solution in which you register like all these opinions right uh, through a blockchain like a, a control plane right okay so and this is what happened so for example if, if the colors represent different algorithms right and uh, and the x-axis represents like the level of difficulty right like so for example uh, the the first like measure is very easy so for example is 80 percent black over 20% like white, right? And then as you progress in the x-axis, you see that like the, the environment was more difficult. So for example, it's 4951, something like this, okay? And in the y-axis, you see the exit probability, yeah? So the, the, so the times that actually the robots reach the right uh, color, right? So basically it's a success rate, right? So one is 100% like uh, the robots like chose the right color, zero is none did it, right? So what you can see in the classical approach versus the blockchain approach is that there's not much difference, right? So um, 
mm, you put like a blockchain like into this like system and somehow you make like things uh, have more overhead you know now robots need like to calculate hashes and then they need like to calculate like proofs and they need to uh, select like a like a validator and a miner and and this kind of thing so so from this graph you will see that there is is an over the, the blockchain is an overkill right uh, because actually you can get like better performance you know with the classical algorithms that do not rely on like blockchain but what we did is like to put into the mix like these like robots that are like programmed to lie for example like they simulate um a hardware problem or a sensor problem so they 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 when they see black they say white or or for example they are just like programmed like to lie like to say okay so if we need to reach like a majority, right? Uh, I am going to say the opposite, right? So the majority is never reached. Or, or for example, if we need like to reach a consensus, like a with uh, all the member with with all the members saying the same thing, I'm just going to say the contrary over and over again. So the consensus is never reached, right? So and then we tried it again, okay? And let's see what happens. So what we did is we got like these robots, like we connected them like through an auxiliary like Ethereum node. The Ethereum, this Ethereum node mine uh, the smart contract, which is kind of like the constitution of the robots, how the robots like reach this consensus and 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 what happens, you know, when, when the consensus is not reached. And then robots register with this smart contract and robots publish and subscribe to this smart contract, right? So at the end, like uh, uh, you have like the robots in a completely distributed way running this like blockchain among them with this the smart contract as, as the one collecting the counts and the votes and, and, and these things. Okay, so this is the results. The results is, uh, for example, in the y-axis, we still have like the su success probability, but in the x-axis, we see the number of bad bots. So how many robots were added in order to breach consensus? So what you can see here is that the state-of-the-art algorithms, as you include more bad bots, the success probability drops dramatically, right? While, for example, in the in the blockchain approach, you can maintain like a very uh, like a very stable like a probability, yeah, even like seventy five percent something like this, right? The difference between one and the other is that uh, in in the normal state of the art algorithms, uh, you are seeing like the process as like a packet based uh, uh, communication process, but in the blockchain, you are seeing like this process as a transaction based uh, uh, process. So the interesting thing is that when a robot starts like to fail or is breached like to like um, or is programmed to breach the consensus, it starts to get into inconsistencies, right? It starts like to say white like to one robot and black to the next robot in a very short period of time. So when you register like these 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 votes, these robots can start like to see that you are starting to get into inconsistencies, and if you are starting to get into inconsistencies, we can assign you a reputation. As a, as a sensor or as a validator or or as a part of the system if your reputation drops uh, under like a certain threshold we we don't trust you anymore and if we don't trust you anymore right we just basically drop you out of the of the system we also created like some like incentive mechanisms in which when you vouch for your opinion you vouch your resources you vouch for example you know your tokens or you vouch like a distopus that serve you like to, for example, recharge batteries, right? So if you start to lie, and then we find out that actually you, you lied, we your tokens or your resources will never be back to you. So in a sense, we create this graph is explained in a situation in which we created a system in which lying costs you money, it costs you resources. And when you have no resources, you cannot talk. And when you cannot talk, you cannot lie, right? So it's it's an interesting like a uh, 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 approach. Okay, so uh, so then after like doing these experiments, like in, in simulation and real robots, yeah, we decided like, to say, okay, so what's what's under the hood of this like blockchain technology? This is interesting. Okay, let's explore more. So what's under the hood, right? Like uh, in these systems, what can we achieve, right? And then we created this uh, this concept of trustable autonomy, in which we we expand. We scale the autonomy of like these uh, um, autonomous systems or so these robots and AIs and whatever. But at the same time, we do it in a way in which is trustable, in which is uh, securely deployable, highly decentralized. Like that. So the first like research that we did in this direction was the idea of saying, okay, the centralized systems are are robust and full tolerant, as we explained, but redundancy comes at a cost, right? For example, in the case of like the robot swarms, right? Uh, this redundancy also implies that every single member of this of this uh, collective has a plan or has like the program about what is supposed to do, 
right? So if, for example, you have a blueprint, if you want to construct, for example, like this like tower, every single robot in the swarm has the plan, has the blueprint of what needs to be uh, constructed, right? And this is like a problem because, yes, as you expand the system, you make it bigger and bigger and bigger, right? You also make the attack cost of understanding like a, what what the outcome of the of the group is very uh, low cost right because the only thing i have to do as, an, as a third party attacker is to get one of these very 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 large system uh, robots and then uh, do reverse engineering on it and then find out the blueprint and then play with this right so we we ex ask ourselves okay can we make uh, big collectives of agents robots people whatever uh, collaborate and cooperate without actually giving them a blueprint of what they have to do. So can you separate the data of the real thing that we have to do from the data verification? And then we it, came, it turns out that yes, we, we, we could do it. And this is basically a technology that uh, is within the blockchain stack called Merkle tree. Yeah, Merkle trees are uh, technology is basically a, a binary tree that instead of having data or having like AI rules or filtering rules, yeah, has hashes. It's kind of like a matrushka. It's kind of like a Russian doll of hashes. So the leaves contain some information, which is hashed into uh, other, other nodes, which is rehashed, which is rehashed, which is rehashed, until you get the, the root, right? And somehow the root is the fingerprint of all the information that is included in the, in the leaves and the order of it. So normally this technology is used in, in blockchain in order to uh, store transactions like in the blocks right for example a send one bitcoin like to b right and then what you have is basically all these transactions and you have like the root uh, uh, inside like the, the block the blockchain like no especially the bitcoin like uh, uh blocks so uh, what we did is okay what will happen if instead of like a transaction instead of a sends one bitcoin to b right we put robot actions there we put a, a combination of a robot action I can move, I can stack, I can pull, I can uh, shake hands, I can uh, do whatever, no? Uh, and a sensor input. Oh, this is like a red piece. Oh, this is a person. This is not a robot. Like, okay. So the combination of action and sensor input makes a task, you know, like in this system. Move, uh, think about the link. Move uh, piece one in place one. Move piece two over piece one. You know, something like that, okay? So what we do is that in the leaf nodes, in the red, in the green uh, nodes, sorry, we, we encapsulate a hash of a robot action and a sensor input. And what we do is that we create like, the whole blueprint of this, of this plan, right? And then we encrypt everything, and then uh, we get like a root node, which is the fingerprint of this plan. And we give it to the robots. And we say, hey, uh, robots, you have to do this. Yeah, you have to do this, which actually the fingerprint is this. But I'm not going to tell you which task you have to do. Discover them by yourself. So robots, what now they do is that they have in an environment, they start like to uh, do proof of work, physical proof of work, which is, okay, I've seen piece number 15. Uh, okay, so what can I do with piece number 15? Can I move it? And then you, you generate the hash of the action, move, and the hash of the sensory input, piece 15. So if this hash all together give you this hash, you know, that this is part of the plan and you have to do this action. This is part of a bigger plan, even though you don't know what all the other actions imply because they are encrypted, okay? So the interesting thing is that if another robot comes and tells you, hey, what part of the plan do you have? They said, oh, I have 10% of the plan completed. So, oh, I have only 5% of plan, plan completed. So you have more information than me. So you can say, okay, in a normal situation, I will trust you because you are part of the system. But now I tell you, prove it. I, I'm not going to trust you. I ju I'm just going to tell you, prove it. So if this robot, for example, for action number two, gives you the hash of the action, the correct action, and the hash of the sensor input, you can validate very clearly that these two hashes that were not able to be forged, were just like a found because the robot did that action in that moment, found that sensor input in that moment, together with the hash of the first leaf and the hash of this leaf gives you the root, which is the root that we all share as a collective. So you know that this robot was in contact with the right information at the right time, but even though you don't trust it, even, even though you don't know if it's a good robot or a bad robot or, or something like that, right? So robots can start like to send and receive proofs to each other. So in a sense, it's kind of like, don't show me your data. I don't know who you are. Just prove that you have it, okay? 
which is an interesting like uh, uh, interaction uh, mechanism. You know, for example, you will find like this video in which we uh, coded a maze, right? So the robots have to make like a maze that they don't know about. They don't know where the entrance and the exit are. So in this video, uh, blue arrows represent like communication patterns. I can see you. Green arrows represent like a query patterns. Hey, I think you have more information than me. And red arrows represent, okay, here you have the proof. So I update you. Well, I think that actually you, you get like the, the idea, right? So at the end, like the, the robots are able like to form like the, the maze, right? Uh, without actually knowing, so these robots do not know where the entrance and the exit are. So if now you get one robot and you say, what do you know about the plan? You will say, the only thing I know is that hash uh, X with hash Y is a uh, part of the plan and I did operation 15 and that's it. Okay, that's the maximum you can get. So um, in this research, we understood, said, okay, so since we have now like this uh, Merkle tree like idea and whatever, why, so is there a way to capitalize this? And they said, okay, normally these like swarms like are very hard like, to get, not, not many labs have them. And there's many people, you know, wanted like to do experiments. But at the same time, these researchers trying to do these experiments in these like swarms do not want other researchers like to see their code or like, a, or, the, the way you know that they program the robots because at the end there's going to be a publication you know they don't know where this has been you know etc right so we said okay let's make a marketplace let's make the first marketplace like for swarm robotics in which we when we are not running experiments on the lab we can put these um these swarms like for hire right and then uh, you will be able like to uh, pay uh, in in your with your crypto wallet uh, the the service and then you will be able to conduct experiments so what we did is creating this uh, marketplace in which the staff of the lab puts the available services in a smart contract, right? That rules this, this uh, interaction. The, the potential customers give the Merkle tree with their actions they want like to do, which nobody knows, not even the operator knows what's gonna happen and what's, what does it imply? And then pays with the cryptocurrency, you know, the, 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 the price that like the staff, you know, that put it. So the smart contract gives the, the Merkle tree to the role, so the roles perform the action. And then uh, the robots give cryptographic proof that this action was was uh, fulfilled, right? And then uh, videos and multimedia material are are sent, right? So let's uh, so we have like a demo, right? Maybe I can I can show you. Uh, let's see. So this is a little bit you know like the demo like page you know, which which we did. So you enter here, you uh, you connect your MetaMask uh, um, wallet. And then, uh, so this, these are three services, you know, that were like run. The interesting thing like about this, that for example, I bought this, uh, this last service, you can get like a result section. And in the result section, you see the output of the Merkle tree, like saying, hey, you put it, you input it this Merkle tree and the robots found the input hashes that full, that complete this Merkle tree. So you know that the robots found the right actions and the right sensory inputs, right? So, so you can be sure that the, 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 the job was not fake. Right. Either way, so what you can see here is that, for example, these robots, I believe, in service three that I was talking about, uh, so they do more or less like a similar thing that you've seen in the video, right? The video before. Hopefully. Uh, 
Okay, but for example, these these uh, robots at the end, you know, make this pattern. So like I I put it like this, like Merkle tree, in order to form this this pattern. And it turns out that this pattern is uh, my my GitHub profile, right? So I used it in order like to personalize like a like a um, profile that I have like in in a, in my code repository or in my social media or whatever. So this interaction, this like marketplace, was the first one like to offer like services. You know, in this case, like the output was multimedia, like from a swarm of robots like to potential clients, right? And this is where we get into the final thing about uh, about Gakashi, right? Like so, the idea is when you have like systems that are secure. And you have, you have systems that are explainable, right? For example, in the consensus and these kind of things, you have possibility to make new business models because now, you know, like the, the economic incentive feels secure enough in order like, to try like new things and, 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 and go like for, for new ways of like making business, right? And this is what we did with DACA2. Try like, to encapsulate all this uh, road that I just explained to you and then try to go one step further. Okay, now if... Let's imagine that like the swarm like does like some operation and then gets paid. Instead of making the lab, you know, get the money in order to maintain the robots and whatever, what happens is if it's the robot itself that actually gets the, the money, what will be able to happen? You will be able like to uh, get more resources and then sustain its activity during longer periods of time. So and this is like the, the source of package, right? So let me show you this, this video that we submitted like to, to this year, IROS. IROS is going to be held in Europe. And we submitted like this like paper, like a... So what you can see is Gakachu is an ex-industrial robot. It's a KUKA K900, right? That we used to do welding and like a, a screw driving like in, uh, in, in, automotive, in the automotive sector. And we just like put like a, pay, a paintbrush, right? So the idea of Gakachu is that uh, it selects a, a topic like in the internet, like based on like some trendy topics, and starts to paint uh, this like topic in Japanese kanjis, right? So then there's an auction, right? And uh, people, you know, can uh, can try, try to buy like the art that uh, Gakachu is producing. The interesting thing is that this um, uh, money goes directly to the robot instead of going to the owner of the robot, right? So the robot can interact with third-party people in order to get uh, resources like uh, human help, like this kind. Of right so let's let me explain you a little bit like more more in detail you know what this is about so we have gakachu here like painting its its uh, kanji um there's an auction in parallel there's a winner of the auction and then when the winner uh, uh, basically makes the, the higher bid then the picture is sent to the winner and this picture is um, physical but there's also like an nft so there's like the digital rights to this picture like sent immediately um and then, uh, yeah, so the money is transferred like, to the robot, and the robot uses this money like for con contacting third party like people in order to get resources, right? In this case, like uh, our shop supplies. So the robot, what it does is that like uh, before painting like, some picture, it says, okay, so I go to, go to Google Trends, I select like a topic, for example, is Children's Day, Kodomo no Hi, and then it says, okay, so Children's Day is translated like this into Japanese, which is basically text. And then uh, use like a library in order to, to transfer it into a, into a picture, right? And with this picture, like uh, it stores it like in the in the internal memory. And uh, what it does in this like internal memory is like to say, okay, so now I'm going to translate this picture into uh, like a skeleton, right? So into strokes, so I can paint it like a uh, with with a brush, right? So in a more detail here, like in the right wing uh, part of the of the slide, you can see that the robot has a um, uh, a depth camera and Intel real sense, you know, which is like at the tip of the of the rock of the end effector. This uh, real sense camera is detecting like uh, the, the canvas, right? Uh, so, for example, you can see it like uh, in in the A picture, like here, a little bit how you detected the borders and you understand where the center of the canvas might be. So you start painting there, and then what it does is that gets uh, this image, preprocesses the images, like so you detect the borders, as I said, and then you start like to do all these kinematics, right? Like so you start like to move the joints so it can fulfill the strokes of the of the preprocessed image that we got like in the previous step, right? So at the end, uh, you have like a closed control loop in which like the robot makes all the strokes, all the different strokes, right? The kind of like shadow style, right? And finishes like the, the picture, right? 
So you see here, for example, like a like a finished picture, you know, like a of the Women's History Month, right? And uh, so what happens, you know, uh, after the the picture is done, uh, is that like a, it automatically the robot like a, a means an, an NFT, which is like uploaded like to uh, to uh, two marketplaces. One is OpenSea, one is Rarible. But I want to check the OpenSea one because I think that there's like something interesting there, uh, which is this. So while we were talking. Uh, Gatachu created like the uh, picture of Henkaku, right? So, so the Henkaku picture, yeah, is it was uh, this NFT was minted at eight fifty nine a.m. <laughs> so, so it was uh, maybe like forty minutes ago, and and yeah, so so you can you can uh, purchase it and the and the high bidder you know will get the picture and the NFT right away, you know, like so. So just if, for you to see that actually this is this is real and like we are still conducting you know like a, a like jokes with it. So I think I'm almost running out of time, so I have to be fast. Uh, but uh, let me explain you a little bit like more about the, the some of the interactions with the robot has. So when after like selling uh, one picture, two pictures, three pictures, four pictures, the robot somehow uh, has a counter of like the the supplies that it has, right? So when the supplies when the art supplies reach uh, one or minus one. Oh, one or, or or zero, sorry. Then, uh, then it sends like a it gets it needs to get supplies, right? So basically, what it does is that uh, connects like to a, a electronic uh, a art shop that uh, we have like created, and then um, the robot sends like a message like saying, okay, so this is your the Ethereum like art shop. I need three uh, x supplies, and I'm willing like to pay, for example, one point zero point one ethers, right? So this message is sent like through the API, like to the to the web shop. And then if the if the webshop says okay, so replies okay, directly it replies to the smart contract running like a two, and then like the, the payment is done and the supplies are are received, right? So uh, this is a little bit, you know, like the overview of all the process, right? Like, so I think that maybe like uh, we will leave it like for for later, you know, like uh, if somebody has a question, you know, we will get deep here. But uh, all this information is in the is in the paper and it's in the uh, uh, supplementary material, so you can you can check it. Uh, and if you have any question, more than happy like to answer. Uh, but this is a little bit, you know, where I want to get uh, to, right? So this is the plot of the wallet of the robot in a six month spread. Right. So what you are going to see here is that there, there's this first initial phase with these uh, red squares, in which the robot, in order to start activity, needs some initial money, in order like to uh, uh, register with the with the NFT auction uh, site, like uh, in order to start minting the NFTs, in, in order to start to get the first supplies. Right. So this uh, money is provided by kind of like investors. Right. It's we that designed the system, you know, invested like some money. Uh, at the beginning of like a Gagachu operation, so for him to start this activity, right? The interesting thing is that after like a, a while, the robot starts like, to sell pictures, you know, which is uh, this um, uh, green diamond, right? And the thing is that when you start to sell pictures, so the so the revenue like starts, right? Um, the robot starts to pay like, for example, like minting fees or like operational fees, for example, the pays the person like to place the canvas like in top of the robot when the robot needs to paint a new picture, a new picture right? So somehow it starts like to get into a different relationship with humans as well, right? And uh, at the end, you know, when this is uh, after X amount of like pictures, the robot starts to repay the money that initial investors like paid. So somehow the idea is that robot, the robot will buy us out. So the initial investors need to be bought out. So at the end, the robot remains Alone in this uh, in this corporation or in this like activity, right? Uh, again, all this information is in the paper. You know, you can check it uh, and and ask me any questions if you have. So, in order to finish like this uh, this um, uh, uh, presentation, I just want to raise uh, a little bit of awareness of like a new field that is starting yeah to emerge. So we know that robots are are important. Uh, this is like something that uh, we all know. Maybe if we are if we are here and we are interested like in these like topics, robots and AI are are here to stay. It's not us against the robots. It's us with the robots, and this could be like a, a fantastic tool to extend us, right? But um, uh, right now, uh, we have like tools, right? Like uh, which I call digital trust, which could be like a cryptographic based solution, blockchain uh, ideas, etc that gives us like a digital trust, right? Maybe 20 or 30 years ago, we didn't have this, but now we have. Now we have like processes, digital process and cryptographic processes that allows us 
to uh, trust a certain process without actually seeing the, the, the input, right? Or, or understanding that a process was very hard to be forged, right? So together, you know, this uh, robotics uh, uh, world and this uh, uh, digital trust form a, a new perspective, which is, okay, autonomy, yes, but not autonomy for the sake of autonomy. Autonomy can be audited, can be, um, can be uh, understood, you know, from a different way, right? And we can trust this autonomy. And of course, you know, there's like a, a third bubble, which is the important one, which is society, right? Like, so the mixture between robots that could be trusted in society form this uh, inner like part there, which I'm super, super, super interested in. I think that in the next years, they are going, it's going to be a field that is going to expand a lot, right? Because there's something new. And I think with this, I finished the presentation. So, so super happy to take questions. And, and yeah, uh, thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Eduardo. Um, and yeah, for anyone who's participating, please feel free to ask questions or make comments in the in the chat, and we can start to pick them up um, in the conversation. But um, I'll just ask questions until we get anybody from the audience. But um, okay. um, Edward, I have a question. Have you have you talked to any lawyers or legal um, scholars? And I don't know where you see an opportunity or in how what what is when you say that the the robot owns the wallet, what what is how how does the robot own the wallet, or is that just uh, 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 I mean, is there any any way that you can make it legally robust? Yes, I mean, so there's different frameworks like uh, right now in um, uh, in the world that is are trying like to understand you know like these uh, algorithmic uh, companies, right? For example, you know there's a lot of like regulation and like uh, work done like with uh, algorithmic trading, you know how this algorithm you know like uh, goes like to the stock exchange and makes like um, uh, some uh, benefits and then how these benefits you know like uh, uh, permeate you know like the organization that like owns the, the algorithm, right? So. So yeah, so I'm currently talking to a lot of like uh, legal people, and what they what they tell me is that uh, there is like a way in which uh, the robot uh, can be uh, considered as an asset of a company, and like uh, the smart contract that uh, that runs like a robot could be incorporated into the um, um, let's say uh, constitution of this like uh, of this new uh, corporation of this new company, and therefore uh, the the robot can have like some kind of like a initial personhood, right? Um, right now, like in experiments that we that we that we have done are just like a, a proof of concept, and we we don't we didn't go the legal way. You know, we are just trying to explore the sustainable the sustainable like path, right? And see how far you know we can get in this sense. But this is like an ongoing conversation. Yes, we yeah. we are talking like together. And and are you mostly interested in physical? I mean. It things that have physical instantiation because it might be for the legal part easier to do like a, a an automated DAO that ends up becoming self-sustaining are you is that an area that you've been working in yes definitely so um uh, as part of this like work but also like in work like more in more like virtual models you know what we are working right now is in the is in the interface Okay, so let's imagine, you know, that the robot in this case, like, needs like to buy supplies, and then somebody needs to place the supplies, you know, like, for the robot, like, to keep on painting. How do you access, like, this uh, human being? How do you start, like, this in, in new interaction with this human being? Uh, regardless, if you are, like, a robot or if you're an AI, you need these interfaces, for example, uh, with mechanical Turk. With uh, in order like to get uh, human assistance, for example, with Task Rabbit, like for example, how you get new data so you learn new skills, right? So we are building these interfaces like to different parts of the society, so the so the AI or the robot can keep on doing what it's supposed like, to do and keep on learning. Yeah, because it feels like DAOs like Brain Trust, where you can, or Torpo, where you can get people to write code, might be um, an interesting thing for it to use. Um, De definitely. Um, definitely. There's a question from uh, Alexis Menenis. I don't know if you can see it. How long does the hash rate generator take for creating the hash? Is it possible for sensitive work that this might generate a delay in performing the action? So we did uh, this like hash based um, uh, kind of like cryptography uh, because it's very, very efficient, right? Like, so for a robot, uh, especially robots like in this like swarm, like a scenario, they are very, they have like a very limited CPU. 
So for them, it's very um, it's very hard like to do like a real proof of work uh, in the in the classical sense, but it's very easy to get like a data and then hash it and then validate the hash, right? So mm -hmm. so even though you have like a very long hashes, like for example, I don't know, five, twelve. 10, 24, something like that, the roads can still keep up, you know, and do like a semi real time operation, rehashing this, this property. So we designed for that. Yes. Yeah. Um, interesting. Um, and then I guess just kind of, this is just a personal, I guess, question, like, where are you going with this? I mean, because I, I can imagine like the speculative design people doing this to show how scary it is, but it seems like you're actually trying to do it. And it's exciting as an idea, but but where like what's what's the best case scenario for 10, 20 years from now for your work? Mm, I think that I'm trying like to redefine the entrepreneur of the future. You know, like I'm trying like to give like a new uh, version of what an entrepreneur is, and perhaps you know like the entrepreneur of the future is a, a guy that can put up like systems that are autonomous in this in this way, in an economical way. And then you can have participations, you know, like in these like systems, right? Like so mm -hmm. so you you have like robots like doing like tasks that you don't want to do like as humans, like and mm -hmm. for example hard task cleaning, I don't know, like uh, uh mining, uh, I don't know, exploring the, the seabed, for example, I don't know. And then you can uh you can have a participation in these robot companies, right? And then you can live out of these like participations, like, for example, right? So uh, what I think is very interesting is the idea of uh, these autonomous entities that you do a task like for us that uh, that also could could um, impact in our uh, quality of life. Right? Think about like um, public uh, robot companies that like uh, do the cleaning of like uh, streets like in cities, and somehow uh, you pay them like for doing like a private job, and and the revenue that they produce pays taxes, right? Pays taxes, and then like produces like a like or sustains a well-being state. I, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting like idea, you know, the autonomous systems that like work in order to help us live better. You know? And and should these robots have rights? Uh, that's that's a very interesting question uh, because if uh, you pay taxes, you know, uh, uh, this means that you are a citizen. This means that you have the rights of a citizen. Uh, so. Um, uh, perhaps uh, yes, you know. Per, uh, perhaps we will start like to see how these like robots, because they enter into a new type of interaction, which is an economic interaction, uh, which immediately turns the robot from a tool to a peer. So think about this, for example, because um, uh, if you if you have a screw if you use a screwdriver, right, you are using just like a tool, right? And so you use it in order like, to get like to it's a means to end, right? But if the screwdriver has to pay you. Right, because uh, you have like to do something else, and then you 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 are getting into a different type of relationship, you know, with the screwdriver, right? Mm -hmm. Or with or with the catch you as a role. So now the tool becomes a peer somehow. So mm -hmm. it would be very interesting to understand what rights do these peers have, right? Yeah. It would be more like pets, uh, uh, or it would be more like I don't know companies that can sue yeah. you. I don't. I, I don't. Be, be, because I think you know humans have a history of exploiting things that are weaker than themselves, including animals. Um, it's also important, I think, to note that in Japan, there's a history of having a relationship with your tools. Mm -hmm. And in Shinto, there you can actually attribute spirits to tools. And even like there's ceremonies for like sewing needles when they're finished, they put them in, I think it's tofu or konyaku, and they put them in the river. And, and there's, a, there's a, a ceremonial respect for tools that I think could um, sort of show up here. Um, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll follow this thread in a minute. I, um, Inoue Kenichi is asking if you have any idea how robots and blockchain could be applied to the medical field. Yeah, so for example, what we did like uh, uh, at the beginning of this project was like uh, using um, uh, robots and blockchain or like to uh, enhance like these uh, autistic therapies, right? So robots could access to data or get knowledge like from data that they were not supposed like to see. Ever, right. So I think that maybe this is the path, you know, like data is very powerful and like the right data at the right time, you know, could, could do many things, especially for example, when robots are treating like a patients or elderly people or this kind of like stuff. So for example, I can, I can totally see a, a robots uh, accessing like to medical data uh, without breaking the, so exploiting the, um, the utility of the data without breaching the privacy, you know, of the of the data and and using it like for treating disease or for like a, making like a um, like a 
a better experience like to people you know that are living with the robots for example in japan you know elderly people you know so i i can totally see it seems like you're so i think that's interesting and it seems like you know privacy enhancing technologies is a really important field right now for medical and i can imagine it for robots but maybe you can use the merkle tree sort of decentralized plan also for human beings right you could imagine maybe that um you can have either patient treatments or patient data or something so that the you know the individuals don't know the whole but can each perform a part i mean I, does, do you, have you thought about applying that merkle tree planning or is it is or is it already applied in for for human systems so this is what we're doing right now so the the good thing about like the merkle tree is that you can separate data verification from data itself so it's a very good like way like to make people collaborate that will not normally collaborate right so if if you want to make people to collaborate to a common goal right but like uh, you uh, you know that the, the agents will never collaborate with each other if they knew that they were like, together uh, this thing is very very interesting like, for that also we found that um is very interesting for corruption right so uh, corruption basically is the mismatch between local and global information right so uh, so this this tool is very helpful like for basically making people have only local information and not global information so mm -hmm. so for example companies that will get like a public uh, contract will not see each other and will not be able like, to lobby uh, like against like the, mm -hmm. the public entity for example yeah yeah it's kind of like blind voting and stuff like that it's it's a interesting this is sort of a related one so Benny Fu is asking is there any possibility that robots will try to lie to real people so to get a better reward? Is you getting more money if this happens? Do you think this is a threat? And I guess it ties to your your reputation and truth um, trustworthiness measurement that you had earlier with the swarm. Is there how how would that apply? Do you think with this robots and human interaction? So I think that the, these uh, new tools like a uh, blockchain base or a cryptographic base like uh, give us like a, a possibility like to. Um, uh, to give proof, to give proof of certain things, right? Without actually disclosing like the data that we don't want to disclose to a robot or, or like an autonomous system or or another human, right? So the interesting like thing is that we are creating like a set of tools in order to make robot in order to make humans trust robots, right? Like a okay, I understand that based on this like a smart contract, this regulation is never going to be breached. This robot cannot do this. This robot will never be able like to do that, right? But yeah. also make robots trust us as humans, you know, because if like goes and says, okay, who are you? Uh, where, what are you doing? Uh, why are you doing this? Now you can give proof that you are doing certain actions or you are who you are or you want to do certain things without actually giving your like a uh, personal data. So, so this, so we, we disentangle who are you? Why are you doing this from the fact that you can prove that what you say you want to prove, right? So, which is very interesting because we we'll, we always go back to this incentive mechanism of, of that that Bitcoin created and blockchain process mm -hmm. created, which is I don't care who you are as long as your incentive is the same as the network, which is securing the network. Uh, being so, I always say that uh, these technologies were the first one like to make crooks uh, secure the network. You know, so. Okay. Have you seen um, um, game theory work by Martin Nowak? Because um, he, he he has an interesting thing. So for the longest time, um, the winning algorithm for Prisoner's Dilemma, which is basically mm -hmm. you, you pay out the most if you both cooperate. But if one cooperates and one defects, then the, the defector gets some and the cooperator loses a lot. And if you both defect, you get nothing, right? Mm -hmm. And the old, old the, the first, the original winning algorithm was tit for tat. So you basically cooperated until somebody defected. And then after that, you keep defecting. That was you basically uh, the, the, the other short um, name for it was fuck you, buddy. And <laughs> that was the winning algorithm. But what Martin did was he created an algorithm that cooperated. So it would it would defect if you defected, but then it would try to trust again. And yes. there were protocols to try to figure out whether you could go back into um, cooperating. And he showed that, you know, networks that were able to signal a desire to cooperate with each other actually ended up doing better than just being um, negative. Um, and he's been working more and more on these cooperative um, um, sort of game theory um, algorithms and basically getting to the point where, you know, it sometimes pays to be um, mistrusting in a trustless network, but then at some point it actually gets, you try to synchronize when to trust each other again. And it seems like that kind of game theory 
combined with some of the, the the blockchain stuff that you're working on would be interesting. Um, I don't know if you've looked at at, at some of the game theory. No, no, not really. But like, I I, I would do it definitely. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll send you some papers and I'll post I'll post it uh, here as well. Sure. Um, but sort of getting getting back to um, you know where where you're you're going with um, this. I mean, do you imagine? Because you were talking about it sounded like individual robots going around and doing things as entrepreneurs, but what about larger systems where you have, you know, very complex, because, because in, in a way, corporations are kind of like robots, right? I mean, they, 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 they live forever. They're algorithmic in many ways. Humans work for corporations um, and they're autonomous and they have a lot of rights as, as humans. So, you know, I think that, um, um, uh, Norbert Wiener used to call them machines of flesh and blood, you know, mm -hmm. so we were already there in some ways, right, where we have these autonomous entities and by attaching physical robots and giving them um, a more coordinating, I think we're just sort of expanding it to another level where it's harder for humans to intervene. But I mean, what do you think of as sort of, do you think that we will all be working for robots possibly rather than just um, having them conveniently be sort of enslaved and doing things we don't want? Well, it's a complicated question, but I, what I what I would like to see is the idea of um, uh, making robots uh, do stuff that we don't want to do. For example, I can totally see uh, robots um, doing wildlife like monitoring, like in the seabed, mm -hmm. or like uh, picking up trash, you know, like uh, or uh, recycling, you know, like trash, and, like from like a uh, dumpsters or 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 these kind of like things, right? And then forming companies, and then understanding, or even for example, uh, forest, you know, like forest create. It's not only like robots; could be actually like a biological robots. For example, yeah. a forest, right? A forest like a, a somehow elevating its relationship with humans or with human society from a just mere resource or a mere tool, right? To appear, right? So imagine like a forest, a forest that basically has a smart contract that says, "Hey, uh, you can log, you know, like this amount of uh, of um, trees, you know, like for this amount of years, and you're going to pay me, and this money, I am going to use it in order to keep on planting like trees or preserving it in certain certain ways, right? So I'm very interested in this change of relationship, you know, that this transaction, you know, like gives, but also I do believe that there is like a possible way in which robots can do things that we don't want to do, and you have a participation. In this, in this, uh, in these uh, entities that you know that pay taxes and they contribute, right? So, so you you are like a like a stock uh, investor. You also are an investor, like in these like companies that like do something for for the company. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just poking just for fun, but also just a way to think about it. But you know, a lot of people have minimum wage jobs helping label images and mm -hmm. there's a whole business in taking doing character recognition that the ai can't recognize and humans have to say that's an a that's a b and it's the very much humans working for computers as labelers and if you think about like an uber driver you know and if uber were yes. managed by a, a machine you know you have that i mean in a way your the human driver is working for the app in uber right or in uber eats you know and so I could imagine that maybe in many cases, robots are gonna work for humans and what humans don't wanna do. But in some cases, even the, the person changing your uh, canvas for, uh, for your, your, your robot arm, you know, it, it's, it's the thing that the robot can't do that the humans are doing, right? So I don't know that that's bad, but it's an interesting relationship, yeah. right? Definitely, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a change of paradigm because, like, normally we are very used to, like, to, uh, for example, you know, like, call, you know, like a like a customer service, you know, and talk to a robot, right? You know, like, and then uh, the robot is uh, annoying or not annoying or whatever, no? Like, but for example, you know, I do believe that, like, in the future, like, robots will call you, you know, will call you in order to say, hey, I have a problem, you know, like, I don't know how to get, like, a stuck in, like, from this situation. Would you give me the solution like to get stuck, you know, and then maybe I, I will pay you back or like a, a we can enter into this like economic relationship or something like that. So yeah. I, I do think that this is like a, a possibility, you know, not, not yeah. humans calling robots, but robots calling humans. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. So instead of um, sort of extending humans, it's more of a peer relationship that you're correct, thinking. Correct. Of. Yeah. Sy symbiosis. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. I can imagine, though, there's still some, you know, rights, like if it depends on how how emotional robots get, but maybe they're going to have, you know, robots only want to 
work with robot owned enterprises, for example, you know, and uh, um, it could get political, we'll see. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe maybe robots are more trustworthy. Like at least uh, yeah. code, code, code code is not interpreted; it's executed, right? Like so, yeah. so maybe you know they 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 believe that like uh, robots are more trustworthy, like uh, uh, peers. Yes, it's true. Yeah. Um. There's a there's a comment. I don't know if you can see, it, but it says from um Denny Fu. Just a comment. I wish such a trust based autonomous system may help us resolve the problem of fake news, helping us people to trust each other. Um. Is is that something you're interested in working on? Just trust in general, and because it's the, the blockchain thing and the Merkle tree and some of those things I think are tools for coordinating. Let's I guess it's reputation coordination, right? Yes. yes. Um, there there was a uh, again there was a I, I'm trying to I can I can find a link later, but there was a there was a paper that I saw where they were trying to figure out how to find bad actors, and there's many ways you do it, and for managing reputation and and um, weirdly, um, at least from this paper, mathematically. Um, instead of like there's hiring police, there's all kinds of stuff, but the least expensive way to flush out bad actors was gossip because yes. it's a low yes. transaction cost because yes. it doesn't cost you much to gossip. And the person, like if, if you forget, if you don't do your homework and I say, Eduardo, I bet you didn't do your homework. The cost of me being wrong is quite high, yeah. but if it's gossip, the cost is quite low and it actually averages out. And so, so they, they were arguing, even though, Many people say gossip is bad. At least the mathematicians thought gossip was a good way to deal with untrustworthy people. But I don't know if you have a thought on on how to deal with um, trust and fake news and things. Um, not really. I think that, for example, um, so now that I'm thinking, uh, perhaps you know, like you said, it's very interesting uh, to uh, make a. Uh, media or people you know that like are um, putting like a, into the public like a, this uh, news like to also like provide a little bit like maybe the hash fingerprints you know like of the inputs they use in order like to create like this like news right so so for example it's interesting like to when you publish like a news like publish like a the root of the Merkle tree of all the pieces of evidence you know you got in order like to write your story and then like a, a, after x amount of time you know when somebody needs to audit like that you say hey you see, you know, like I had this information back then, you know, like and it, right now it's, it's okay like to deliver it or like to disclose it, but but I can prove, you know, that like the fingerprint that I had like in, in this time in the article, it was information that I had, you know, like back then and I didn't change it and I didn't alter it and whatever. So this this will bring like a new layer. So it will be more, it will be harder, you know, like to to create like this like a noise, you know, just for the sake of creating like noise. You know, if you have to prove at some point in time that you have the information you said you have. So yeah, I, 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 mean, I can sort of, it's sort of like citations on an academic paper too, right? It sort yes. of links to the provenance of the information that you're using. Although there's obviously interesting problems with that, but um, but it, it maybe we can solve some of the academic publishing issues at the same time. Um, yeah, yes, that 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 needs urgent uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. revisitation. Yes. Um, I mean. Have you thought about using some of these structures to do money making or fundraising for research? Yes. Uh, so, for example, in the first case, like uh, it was like about this. It was like about the idea that I wasn't allowed, you know, with uh, the access of this like, swarm, which is like a very rare because like there's only two, three labs in the world that has like this uh, this hardware, and many people publish only like a simulation based uh, uh, research, right? So it was the idea of saying, okay, I have the swarm ready. It's going to be in one hour. I'm going to run the next frame, but this time the the robots are available, right? Like so, so yeah. So what we did was like uh, putting this like live, you know, like we uh, published. On Reddit, and then like we had like a couple of like jobs, right? So most likely all the jobs were not research. The outcome was not research based. Was like more multimedia videos and and artistic like, things. But but yeah, but this money went to the lab, and the lab it just it just did in order to maintain the robots. So so yes, I mean this is a possibility. Uh, I can totally see, uh, for example, like papers. You know, the outcome of a research being having like a smart contract side in which you, in order to keep on doing the research, in order to keep on maintaining like the research, you you can get and gather like funds, and then the funds, you know, like um, fund the next uh, version of the paper, for example, right? So you you, I mean. Right now, like the core of this of this DAO is like a robot that produces like physical goods, even though it means NFTs. But but you can change this like to any kind of like digital ad asset that needs to have a life, right? Or uh, or some kind of like a life cycle, right? So I can totally see, for example, research projects or GitHub repos, you know, like being uh, involved in the future, you know, with this with this technology for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That'll be one of the questions on grant proposals. Is your is is your research self sustaining? <laughs> 
Yes, because because it finds itself. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Um, so what what's what what are you what are you working on now? What's your next what's your next big thing? Do you think? Well, um, so so right now it was I a am, secret. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a little bit secret, you know. But but yeah. So I, I am trying to wrap up, you know, like all this and try like to uh, make a, a a good proposal, either like for like a high visibility like a journal, you know. So I create awareness a little bit on this, or basically create like a project that in which I can involve mm, different people. So uh, yeah. legal people, uh, roboticists, uh, mm, uh, city planners, like uh, this kind of stuff. So this is a little bit what I'm working. On. That's cool. So. I guess one thing is, um, I know you're working on a lot of things, but one of the things that would be helpful is if you can um, interact with the uh, um, Henkaku community, the Chiba Institute community. And um, I know you're part of our Discord channel. I'm going to paste um, the invite link to anybody who wants to join our Discord channel. But what would be, I think, because you, you were saying that you wanted to try to expand some of the ideas for your publication in the paper. And so maybe um, I'll, let's. I wonder which channel would be good to do this in. Um, um, but it, it would be fun to, um, if, if you have time to, um, you know, we can share the link to the paper in in the in the Discord, and maybe other people can interact with you there and make suggestions or have ideas on the paper. I think that would be that would be great. Um, and yeah. That would be fantastic. I am actually I'm looking like for uh, people, you know, like to read like uh, all the research, you know, that I explain and give it like a new direction, you know, like and if they can take it to their like to their field, would be even more great. So, so yeah, fantastic. Okay, so I'll I'll have somebody set up a um, CIT channel to have the continue this conversation. Um, I don't know if anybody else has questions or comments. I want to, you know, continue this conversation, but I think it'll be fun to involve some of the others. There's a bunch of people who joined from um, CIT, and uh, it would be interesting to see if there's something that we can do in the next phase. I and mean, we're trying to do Web3 stuff, and we have a number of um, smart contract engineers and others now, both in the Hinkup community as well as at CIT. So um, it would be really neat. and. Um, I know somebody was asking about medical. Um, I'm in the process of trying to spin up some um, medical um, related blockchain and privacy enhancing technology work, which I think would be interesting. And so, and I think that's what's fun about your work as well as a lot of the work that comes out of the Media Lab where it's playful, but has um, some really interesting um, real world societal impacts. And I think medical robots is interesting. There are also a lot more robotic operations, for example, that are happening at you know Fujita and other places that we know. So. Mm -hmm. That might also be kind of an interesting um, area to see how um, sort of controlling and trust and medical data around robots will be uh, um, uh, an important area. Um, I don't know if anybody has any other questions, I, um, but thank but thank you, Eduardo, very much for your presentation. It was super my, interesting. My pleasure. My pleasure. It was a great pleasure to be here. And uh, and hopefully we'll have you back. And for everyone who joined us today. Um, you know, we'll send you, we'll send you uh, a follow up. Please join our Discord, and um, I will see you uh, online, and um, maybe for some of you in person at CIT. Thank you, Eduardo. Bye bye. Bye bye.